basketball action. UConn basketball action. And in the result of their clash this weekend with Boston University, may lie the Huskies' chances for an invitation to postseason play in the NIT. This is George Ehrlich. Join Arnold, Dean, and me right here on Channel 3 as we bring you the UConn regular season finale against the Terriers of BU. Watch tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. This is Channel 3, WTIC-TV in Hartford, Connecticut. Good evening, this is Dick Bertell with the local edition of the 6 o'clock report. The controversy over the people mover proposed for Bradley Field has taken another turn. Three state groups have filed a joint action suit in federal district court to oppose the project. The state NAACP, the Connecticut Transportation Coalition, and the Connecticut River Ecology Action Corporation cite as grounds for their action due process and the Clean Air Act. We know that this project will affect the clean air in Hartford two ways. It will stimulate automobile traffic by providing parking at the airport, and it will use up state monies which could have been used for the development of real mass transit. We hope to create a climate in which the Department of Transportation must involve the public and the legislature in the beginning of decisions rather than after the decision has been made. NAACP Executive Director Ben Andrews says the people mover proposal is both fiscally and morally irresponsible because it would serve a limited number of people at a time when so many need mass transit to reach jobs, schools, and medical care. And he doesn't accept the idea, sometimes cited, that the people mover would represent an experiment in transportation, the results of which could be applied elsewhere later. My response to anything related to experimental, uh, this is a thing, uh, when you start talking about experimenting with anything, you do that when everything is in order. When all other major priorities have been met, at that time I can, uh, uh, and I think most of the groups that we're joining with, could accept the idea of developing something like this. But this is not the time to start experimenting with that kind of money when so many people are in need. That's the part that, uh, that we base our charge of irresponsibility on those who are promoting this kind of concept. Governor Meskel defended his decision to go ahead with the people mover at his news conference this morning. He said, if every judgment I make is going to be subject to approval by the NAACP or some other group, nothing would ever get done. The Connecticut Citizen Action Group says Governor Meskel is reneging on his promise to put more money into mass transportation. The CCAG says a pending bill would emasculate a provision in an earlier law which requires that increasing proportions of the transportation fund be directed toward mass transit. Under the pending bill, says the CCAG, that provision would be emasculated to say the governor need only recommend that 10% of the fund be used for mass transit each year. There was some reaction today to proposed major changes in Hartford area traffic patterns. WTIC newsman Sherm Tarr reports. The State Department of Transportation's plan to improve safety on superhighways through Hartford is being met with a wait-and-see attitude by the Greater Hartford Chamber of Commerce. In the past, the Chamber has opposed closing off downtown ramps unless they were replaced with new access roads. The state proposals will mean fewer on and off ramps on Interstates 84 and 91, as well as the Whitehead Highway in Hartford, but traffic tie-ups could be cut by widening I-84 from four to six lanes through downtown, by removing tolls from the Charter Oak Bridge, and by completing a connector from I-84 to I-91 using a widened Elm Street. The Chamber wants to analyze these and other proposed changes in the $40 million plan to ensure there is enough access to downtown and to see whether express bus lanes can be set aside on the highways into Hartford. The Chamber says the complex proposal could make it easier to use mass transit and thereby relieve steadily increasing commuter traffic congestion, but a final decision on the business group's stand will not be made until further study. Sherm Tarr, WTIC News, Hartford. The General Assembly's Appropriations Committee has voted to draw up a bill which would require the State Transportation Department to build a scale model of an Interstate Route 84 connector. The legislators want a scale model of the proposed connector now under consideration. Appropriations Committee co-chairman Nicholas Lenz says the committee wants the model, 
so it can decide whether the connector would destroy the appearance of the Capitol or nearby Bushnell Park. At the state capitol this morning, Governor Meskel signed the first major bill of the current session and knocked the wind out of a rumor that he was in line for a federal judgeship. Bill Mill filed this report. The state capitol saw a flurry of activity today based on a report from a fairly new organization in Washington, the Connecticut News Service. The report said in effect that Senator Lowell Weicker was about to name his nominee for a vacancy on the second federal court of appeals and that the nominee would be Governor Meskel. A quick check with the senator brought a reply that he has made no offer to the governor, that he has had no request from the governor, and that he has not discussed the matter with the Connecticut News Service. Much the same answer came later this morning from Governor Meskel, who said he has no plans for making any such announcement and that the information is not correct. He said the only question before him right now is whether or not he'll seek re-election, and he's not going to worry about options unless he decides not to run. For that matter, he said the senator clearly wants him to run again. He has never let an opportunity go by without uh, urging me very strongly to run and telling me why he thinks I can win and why he thinks I should run. And, and uh, he's been very supportive along those lines. As for the bill signing, the governor put his name on the bill repealing the sales tax on utility bills, but he expressed disappointment at one flaw he's discovered and expressed the hope that the legislature will be able to fix it. The bill becomes effective today, but Hartford Electric Light began a two-month billing period two days ago. And without some action by the General Assembly, Helco customers will have to pay their sales tax for another 60 days. Coaxing good gas mileage from your car these days can be a battle. But your Lincoln Mercury dealer can help you fight it. With a couple of neat little tricks we call the mileage cars, Comet and Capri. There's our gas stingy six-cylinder Mercury Comet with custom option that's got a little cougar in it. Glove soft buckets that recline, extra thick carpeting, even steel belted radial tires. Or if you're out to get mileage European style, take a long look at Capri, our sexy European, with four-cylinder gas economy and standard features like floor shift, rack and pinion steering, power front disc brakes, and steel belted radials. Capri and Comet, the mileage cars, two little beauties that prove the first place to look for small car gas mileage is your Lincoln Mercury dealer. The month of March was up to form today. It came in like a lion, or maybe a pussycat. Here's Ken Gary with details at the Traveler's Weather Service. Not a very ferocious lion, Dick. Uh, last night, Buzz Bernard called it a big sheep, and this morning, Jerry Wilson likened it more to a goat. Anyway, somewhere between, somewhere halfway between a lion and the proverbial lamb. Showers we had this morning are long gone on the weather radar. No precipitation showing up. We do have variable cloudiness over the region, and uh, skies won't completely clear tonight. We'll have some cloudiness still with us. Gusty northwest wind, at least that was March-like this afternoon. Gusty uh, wind from the northwest, that'll be slowly dying down tonight. Temperatures right now a little above normal on our temperature map in the 40s around southern New England. New Haven, 48 degrees, and Springfield, 43, and here in downtown Hartford, now at 46. Does range down to the 30s off to our west and north, and with a northwesterly wind, we do have a cooling trend for tonight. Not very cold, just cool. So the forecast for tonight, for the sky condition, partly cloudy or fair. Let's choose fair because it's easier to write, if nothing else. No precipitation and morning lows between 25 and 32 degrees over the region. On the national map, we had a little cool front pass us this morning. It caused the showers. It's moving away to the east now. Variable cloudiness left through the middle of the nation. A couple little minor disturbances over the central and northern plains. They'll be coming along. However, they'll be tending to weaken and die out as they come eastward. But even so, there's a fair amount of moisture available. So although we won't have a storm, we do expect some occasional very light rain or snow late tomorrow and tomorrow night from the combination of these two as they pass by. Then once they're passed, fair weather returning for Sunday. The forecast then, tomorrow and tomorrow night. For the sky condition, let's call tomorrow mostly cloudy. If there's any sunshine, it should be in the morning. More cloudiness for the afternoon. Probability up to 6 and 10 late in the day tomorrow. And highs just 40 to 45, let's say around 42. Cloudy skies for tomorrow night, leave it at 6 and 10. Certainly no storms, certainly nothing heavy. More like showers, really. And temperatures tomorrow night, lows in the 30s. 
the season's heating requirement shown by the degree day total, which is now up to 4237. We're three quarters of the way through the heating season, and this total remains 9% below normal and 7% below that of last year. Our wind direction here downtown, northwest. A gusty northwest wind at the wind speed at the moment is, uh, well, there's a gust up to 20 miles per hour. We're still getting occasional gusts up to 30. It'll be slowly dying down tonight. Temperature here downtown at 46. Our high today was 50. The relative humidity around 50%. The dew point at 29. And the pressure reading 29.97. That reading corrected to sea level. You can set a home barometer to this reading 2997. Now it's rising. Our air index is up at 5 this morning. This afternoon at 3 on the scale. Slightly cleaner than the average in downtown Hartford. So fair and cool for tonight. For tomorrow, mostly cloudy and cool. Looks like some occasional light rain or snow showers over the area late tomorrow and tomorrow night. Dick? Thank you, Ken. A picket line today at a state college. That story from WTIC's Bill Haskell in New Haven. The pickets were mostly members of the faculty at Southern Connecticut State College outside of New Haven. There were about 50 faculty members supported by others, including some students. The occasion was a visit to the college by members of the Board of Trustees of the State Colleges for its regular monthly meeting. The issues concerning the faculty were two, a claim that the board has been making personnel policy without much consultation with the people affected by that policy. Dr. Peter Sakalowski of the Faculty Executive Committee told me that critical personnel issues, such as retirement, are decided by the board and just passed on to the faculty members. The second issue concerns a recent salary adjustment ruling by the board. The SCSC Faculty Senate says the adjustments both don't make sense in terms of inequities and fail to cover many members of the non-teaching staff, for example, librarians. The salary adjustment plan is described as inadequate, discriminatory, and illogical. Bill Haskell, WTIC News, New Haven. A Democratic gubernatorial hopeful has charged that Consumer Protection Commissioner Barbara Dunn has a history of what he calls inept and indifferent enforcement of consumer laws. Frank Zullo made the charge in attacking what he called inaction and making the public aware that they can save money by demanding that they get prescription drugs by their generic rather than by brand name. Second District Congressman Robert Steele says Senator Ribicoff has called for campaign reform while starting his own re-election campaign more than a year before this year's election. Steele is considered a possible opponent of Ribicoff. He said, how hypocritical can you get calling for campaign reform and then raising big money way back in September to form your committee. The former head of the Connecticut Citizen Action Group is seeking the 6th District Congressional seat being vacated by Representative Ella Grasso. Toby Moffat, who left the CCAG last month, announced his candidacy for the Democratic nomination today in Bristol. Toby Moffat cites his experience as a consumer advocate as teaching him much about fighting for the average citizen, and his campaign will revolve around the issues that concern that citizen. It will be a campaign of alternatives to the disastrous moral and economic consequences of the, of the Nixon administration's policies. And it will be a consumer's campaign and a small businessman's campaign against the creeping closed enterprise system that is thwarting competition and fueling inflation. On the energy crisis, Moffat says he favors a rollback in oil prices at this time, and he offered this assessment of the Nixon administration's handling of the oil shortage to date. As long as you have uh, Mr. Simons, who's very sympathetic to the oil companies, uh, Mr. Johnson, his top assistant, who said that the main problem of the, uh, the, the main cause of the crisis is that prices were too low, uh, as long as you have people like that, you had two top people re resign uh, last week from uh, Mr. Simon's staff, and they're going to be replaced reportedly with oil executives. Uh, the government policy is going to continue to be the, uh, the oil policy. Moffitt joins former Winstead Mayor William Riska in the Democratic race, and New Britain Mayor Stanley Pack is also rumored to be interested. Moffitt says he is in the contest to win and will go to a primary if necessary to get the nomination. Ginny will see WTIC News. A beautiful shoe by Kenny Shoes. Platform soles and big high heels, lots of colors too. Of all the things we like the best, one must be this shoe. A Kenny shoe we're proud to show. $10.99 for you. Big and bold or rugged shoe. $10.99, it's true. 
A real man's shoe while they last at the Kenny store near you. A lot of style. Ten ninety nine. Ten ninety nine. It's true. Here's one answer to high food prices. The 22 cent breakfast. This carnation instant breakfast cost about 22 cents, including the milk. That's right. For about 22 cents, you get as much nutrition as this bacon and egg breakfast when there's no time for your regular breakfast. Read the label. Milk supplies substantial nutrition. One answer to high prices? Carnation instant breakfast. The 22 cent breakfast. Don't take winter sitting down. Go get a bag of Morton Safety Salt. Well, in sports, honors are being accorded the University of Hartford basketball team. Yes, George Ehrlich has the story. <laughs> okay, Dick. Well, the Hawks have been honored, and they deserve their honors. They're right now 18-2 and, and ranked number one in New England. And now Coach Gordy McCullough, seated between assistants Roger Wickman and Bobby Knight, has been named New England College Division Coach of the Year by the National Association of Basketball Coaches. And the coaches have also honored the Hawk co-captains, Pete Egan, the high-scoring forward named to the first-team All-New England College Division, with his co-captain, floor general Chuck Harding, named to the second team. Also in basketball, the Connecticut Huskies hope to wrap up an NIT bid tomorrow afternoon when the Yukons end their regular season against Boston University, a game you'll see right here on Channel 3 beginning at 2 p.m. And you'll be seeing three of Coach D. Rose seniors in their final home appearance. Captain Jimmy Foster, Cal Chapman, who reached the 1,000-point plateau last Tuesday, and consistent Gary Kustick, all three with a major part in UConn's 17-7 record to date. In pro basketball, Captain Willis Reed of the New York Knicks is still trying to recover enough to rejoin his team for the NBA playoffs. John Kennelly of WCBS-TV New York asked Reed about his progress. I like this thing about more than 50%. I think I'm closer to 70, 75, 80, you know, somewhere in that range because I think that basically the only problem I really have here now is um, a product of me getting the leg, finished getting the leg as strong as I needed to be able to do the kind of moves and things that I have to do on a basketball court and with do be able to do that without a buildup of fluid in the knee, and this is the things that we're working at now. Joe, specifically, what are you trying to do here to Willis's legs? Strengthen them? increase their mobility or cut down on pain? Basically, three things. One is restore the normal function of the knee, which means both strength, mobility, endurance, and so forth. Number two, we try to prevent a, a recurrence of the same injury. Number three, we try to prepare him for full-time playing at full speed. So instead of just focusing on the area that was injured, the knee, we do a total conditioning program, which covers all the muscles of both legs. And do the Knicks need those both legs for that playoff? In football, former Notre Dame star and Heisman Trophy winner Joe Theismann has signed a three-year contract with the Washington Redskins after three seasons up in Canada. And in baseball, old New York Giant baseball fans are mourning the passing of 87-year-old Larry Doyle, a second baseman on John McGraw's pre-World War I teams. He won the National League batting championship back in 1915. An international gymnastic meet begins tonight in New Haven and continues tomorrow, the meet involving a number of Olympians and in part arranged by a former Olympian, Muriel Grossfell, speaking with Bill Haskell. Muriel, what foreign teams are involved here? Uh, the first team is the Polish men's national gymnastics team, and they were placed fourth in the last Olympic Games in Munich. And the women's team that will be coming to New Haven is the Czechoslovakian national women's team, and I'm sure people remember their team for Czeslavska, who was the winner of the 68 Olympic Games, and for all their past victories. They are usually the top one or two team in the world. Mm -hmm. How about local input? What local groups will be participating? Well, for the men's competition, Southern Connecticut has been uh, developing in the last 10 years into one of the top men's gymnastics schools in the country. We have former Southern Connecticut uh, 
athletes, Johnny Crosby, who was the winner of the most gold medals uh, in the Pan American Games of any athlete, and then some of these students who are still eligible are also on our national team in gymnastics. So Southern Connecticut is a very strong team. And for the women, we have members of Southern Connecticut Gymnastics Club, and our team has been either first or second in the country uh, for the last well, eight to ten years. We've produced Olympic gymnasts and uh, Pan American gymnasts and national champions. So both teams are fairly strong for just being a local team. I never had a coach who looked like that. Day. <laughs> hey, have a good vacation in Hawaii. Thank you very much, George. The Connecticut Council on Freedom of Information wants the state legislature to clarify the law on public access to town meetings. Involved is a suit by the Vernon Journal Enquirer against the town of Enfield. The town claims that newsmen have no legal right to attend town council meetings. The Connecticut Civil Liberties Union wants George Meskel, or rather Governor Meskel, to appoint a committee to look into what the rights group calls dangerous invasions of privacy due to the age of the computer. CCLU Director William Ohl says unless we act quickly, in his words, we will all become robots. The Greater Hartford Board of Realtors is urging its members to exercise caution in dealing with prospective home buyers. In a letter to members, the board said to treat every customer as if he or she is a tester. That was in reference to charges two weeks ago by a Hartford civil rights group that realtors were steering home buyers according to race. A new motion has been filed by the Candlewood Lake Defense Association in that group's fight against a proposed housing development on the lake shore in the new Fairfield area. A spokesman for the group says a motion of default is being filed against the owner of the land and the developer of a partially built dam across the lake. If the gasoline shortage has got you scared, partner, get a horse. Your Ford dealer has three little thoroughbreds named Pedal, Maverick, and Mustang II. They're easy riders, dependable and economical. The base pedal gets over 20 miles to the gallon. And these days, that ain't hay. So see your Ford dealer and saddle up. Get a Pedal, Maverick, Mustang II. But brother, get a horse. How many ways can you use your credit card? I use my American Express card to go shopping here in New York City, in nice boutiques especially, expensive boutiques. I use my American Express card to buy a long dress for my wife on Madison Avenue. I've even used my American Express card to charge two theater tickets. Mine was never turned down. The American Express card goes anywhere and everywhere. Call 800-AE-85000 to apply for an American Express card. Federal labor officials have an April 30th deadline to decide how to fund nearly $2 million in various projects to help Connecticut's migrant workers this summer. Tom Seam has the story. State Department of Community Affairs Commissioner Ruben Figueroa is setting up a new office of migrant affairs in his department. He wants the U.S. Labor Department to give this new office all the funding for various health and other grants previously handled by the New England Farm Workers Council the Shade Tobacco Growers Association, and other groups. The Migrant Affairs Office would then subcontract with the non-state agencies for services they have been providing up till now. The idea, says Figueroa, is to provide better control of the money and the services. Figueroa met for more than four hours today with federal labor officials, representatives of state agencies, and leaders of the Council of Farm Workers over one part of that funding, a $250,000 general grant for tobacco workers. It's up to the Labor Secretary in Washington to decide now just how the funding will take place for this grant through the new state agency or, as in the past, through the Council. Federal officials made no firm predictions except to say the state proposal looks interesting. One point cleared up, however, dealt with so-called problems linked to the Farm Workers Council in the past. It was established today that most of the alleged problems at tobacco farms stemmed not from the Farm Workers Council, but from organizers from two other more militant labor groups. All this may affect the Labor Department's decision. Meanwhile, Figueroa's ouster as DCA commissioner is being requested by two Spanish-American groups, and Sherm Tarr has that story. Tom, Hartford's Spanish-American Civic League and the Hartford chapter of the National Congress of Puerto Rican Veterans claim the commissioner has used federally funded programs to advance his own political career. Lawyers for the two groups claim that a $54,000 program to aid Hartford area Puerto Rican veterans is threatened by Figueroa's actions. They also deny the commissioner's claim that the league ran the program badly. 
They charged the real reason Figueroa shifted control of the program money from the League to a New York group in December was the desire to control political patronage. Attorney Sidney Showman, representing the veterans group, cited a threat he said was made last summer when the dispute between Figueroa and the board of the League first surfaced. That if Mr. Figueroa's people on that board of directors were not left as is, and if Mr. Figueroa's director, and I'm not quoting exactly, obviously, were not left in office, then Mr. Figueroa would see to it that all funding was stopped to the Spanish-American Civic League. The League later did remove the commissioner's friend as director of the veterans program. The two groups fear Figueroa's political actions will hurt the unity of Hartford's Spanish-American community and harm a program they feel has benefited local Puerto Rican veterans. That's why they want the commissioner ousted. Dick? Thank you, Sherman. Danbury police have charged 18-year-old Richard Miller of Danbury and 16-year-old John Johnson of New Fairfield with the murder of 14-year-old Charles Henderson of Danbury. Police say the Henderson boy was shot February 21st as he and three companions were walking along a driveway that they used as a shortcut. In Springfield, 17-year-old Kenneth Walters has been bound over to Superior Court in connection with the beating death of former Enfield School Superintendent Carl Lee. What has become a worldwide tradition was observed in Hartford today. World Prayer Day was observed today at Christ Church Cathedral in downtown Hartford and in churches throughout the world. The international services were sponsored nationally by Church Women United and prepared by the women of Japan. The theme was Make Us the Builders of Peace, and Speaker Lorraine Grizzless, a candidate for the Masters of Divinity degree, urged those present to work for peace beyond the walls of the church. We come here to get our marching orders, then go out where the action is. We come here for strength and nourishment, then go out to continue the work and the fight. Go and make disciples was the order given us. Go to the voting booth, to the touring work, to the inner city, to the straggly suburbs, to the school meetings and the budget reports, to write letters of protest as well as support, to read and assemble your store of information and supplies wherever and in whatever area your talents and gifts, time and money suggest. We dare not sit in corners either at home or in church with so much peace building work in front of us. Tonight's the night for Simsbury Farms Recreation Center's Winter Spectacular. The show goes on ice at 7. Ron Milligan went to dress rehearsal and has this story. Winter Spectacular Day is a big one at Simsbury Farms Rec Center. Last year, more than 2,000 people turned out just months after the rec center's opening. This year's turnout remains to be seen, but the cast numbers over 200. Even a cast with 200 performers, however, can't always be considered big. Most of these just got their ice legs in a recent Learn to Skate program at the rec center. The Winter Spectacular is really a low-budget production. Although the town fathers had to cough up several hundred dollars for it, the costumes come on loan from a sympathetic Hartford Ballet Company. Sympathetic because, as you may have guessed from the music, the Winter Spectacular is a rendition of a classic ballet, the Nutcracker. Not all the beauty of delicate grace, though, and in a dress rehearsal, the nutcracker can seem a headcracker. Costume fittings, rehearsals, skating practice, more than a little ballet, 
and what comes down to an awful lot of work for something that looks like such fun, Simsbury takes to the ice for its second winter spectacular. This is Ron Milligan, WTIC News. The New York stock market closed moderately lower today. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed down 8.61 at 851.92. Rechecking our traveler's weather service radar, it shows no precipitation. The forecast, tonight fair, lows 25 to 32. Tomorrow, increasing cloudiness, highs 40 to 45. Cloudy tomorrow night, occasional light rain or snow tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow night. It's 46 degrees in downtown Hartford. Rechecking our top local news story of the hour, the controversy over the people mover proposed for Bradley International Airport has taken another turn. Three state groups have filed a joint action suit in federal district court to oppose the project. The state NAACP, the Connecticut Transportation Coalition, and the Connecticut River Ecology Action Corporation cite as grounds for their action due process and the Clean Air Act. That's the local edition of the six o'clock report. Stay tuned now for CBS News. This is Dick Bertel. Good night.